good afternoon to everyone who's in the audience now. Um, thanks for joining us for the Global Hydrogen Economy uh, webinar series, the August edition, where we'll be hearing from our distinguished speaker on setting yourself up for a successful career in the new energy industry. Uh, my name is Charlotte, and I'm a PhD candidate from Particle and Catalysis Research Group, and I'll be chairing this webinar session today. Before we start, I would like to first acknowledge the Bijigal people that are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm presenting from today. I would also like to pay my respect to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. And I would also like to remind the audience to please mute your microphone during this presentation and to post in the chat if you have any questions. Um, please also note that this webinar would also be recorded and uploaded into the Global Hydrogen Economy YouTube channel. So I'd like to first take a moment to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Benji Lee, who is a visionary leader and expert in the new energy industry with vast experience spanning over two decades covering environmental engineering, carbon management, commercial and public affairs roles across a variety of sectors, which also include a decade at Gemini where he led their energy policy advocacy. Benji has also worked collaboratively on energy policy and market development through his contribution to influential industry associations, such as the Business Councils Australia, Energy Networks Australia, AI Group, Australian uh, Hydrogen Council, and many others as well. So Benji consults as a strategic advisor to the Future Fuels, CRC, Center for New Energy Technologies, and a wide range of other clients across the energy and transport sectors as well. And he specializes in energy policy and market development to scale new energy technologies, future workforce planning, and decarbonization strategy development. So whether you're a fresh graduate, seasoned professional looking for a career change, or an entrepreneur, seeking new ventures. These sessions will provide valuable insights as Benji shares his anecdotes and guidance on how you can set yourself up for a successful career in this thriving domain. So without further ado, please welcome Benji Lee. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And I'm really excited and happy to be yeah, speaking to you all. And thanks for yeah, inviting me uh, onto this webinar. Um, look, I guess my first piece of advice, and maybe if we go to the first um, slide of the presentation. If it, I'll wait for that to come up, but um, I guess what I wanted to sort of share was, um, and you know, I, I'm mindful I'll have a lot of technical sort of people in, in the webinar. So, my first piece of advice is really it's okay to be afraid about talking about yourself. Um, as a te technical person, that can be hard. I found that quite hard. But um, the learning is really about getting more comfortable talking about yourself and it will help you know yourself better. So the more effort you put into that area early in your life, uh, the better. Um, and it will avoid you jumping straight into transactional, what I call transactional conversations with people, um, which are more jumping into the safe, either technical or commercial spaces that, you know, people can often talk about without taking the time to get to know the person that you're dealing with. Um, so if you concentrate at the start of your conversations with people in the new energy industry um, and get to know them, you're gonna form closer relationships and deeper relationships quicker, and it will serve you very well in, in your career. Now, with that in mind, I know I can't, um, and I would love to meet personally everyone on this webinar and, and know a bit about them and have that you know, connection. Um, I know I can't do that, but what, what I am going to take the time is tell you a bit about my story, share a bit personally about how my career evolved. And I think it'll help you understand too, when I come to some other pieces of advice and stories that I wanna share 
um, just a little bit more around where I'm coming from and hopefully you connect with that. So um, the first thing to really say is I'm a proud Tasmanian, um, but I love living in Melbourne. Um, and I've lived in Melbourne the last 30 years. Uh, I lived there with my partner and my 14-year-old um, daughter um, and uh, our labradoodle called Raz, which is short for Razmataz. Um, I grew up in a farm in northwestern Tasmania, an absolutely beautiful natural place, a close community of tough, hardworking people. Um, I learned a lot about adaptability and helping to keep a farm and business sort of running, you know, you know the family business. Uh, when I was 18, I moved over to the, the mainland um, and that was the making of me. Um, it was also the breaking of me. Um, I left this close community, which I talked about in Tassie, um, to go and study environmental engineering. You know, it had captured my imagination. I'd seen it in a book in the, the career section of, the, of my um, uh, high school. Um, and I, yeah, remember vividly leaving, you know, the airport to fly over to Melbourne. Um, and I couldn't even talk to my mum and dad or look them in the face. Like it was, a, um, yeah, the emotions were too much for me. And, you know, I was in shock over on the mainland, um, struggling to walk down the street because there were so many people. I was used to very, um, you know, a quiet, uh, calm sort of environment in Tasmania and straight into the city. Um, when I say it was the, I guess, the breaking of me, I sort of talked to those points, but it was also the making of me. So I think, you know, as I've reflected over my career, that loss of community sent me on a real search around building community, building support networks, building relationships, and it has served me so, so well in my career. Um, I didn't know anyone in the whole state of Victoria. Um, and when I look back now over 30 years, it's amazing what can happen over that time in terms of support networks and, and, that, and developing a career. Um, so I studied environmental engineering um, I also picked up another a degree in science, in geology. Uh, I worked in the water resources sector for a few years um, and crunching a lot of numbers uh, on extreme rainfall analysis that would be used in dam break analysis. There was flood mapping, there was water quality modeling, um, I got hooked on the ones and zeros and computer programming, loved it, loved every technical piece of it. Um, went back and did a grad dip in computer programming. Um, it was around the time of the dot-com era and I jumped out of environmental engineering and went into doing IT in the, um, in the manufacturing sector. Um, I was happily doing that, learning lots of technical things. Um, and a few years into that role, um, there were protests out the front of the uh, office. Um, and the company that I was working for uh, was Australian Paper and it was logging old growth forests. And um, that was a bit of a reckoning for me because I was sitting in the office, seeing the protests, hearing what the people in the office were saying about the protesters and values wise, it didn't fit with me what some of the people were saying in the office. So I knew I needed to do something differently. Um, and I was given the opportunity to go and work in an environmental education. Um, so I jumped back into the environment sector um, it was a time where um, 
climate change wasn't talked about very much. It was sort of in the early 2000s, we'd celebrate if there was a article in the age, probably every three months. Um, but it was an amazing creative time where I worked a lot to sort of bring climate change onto the agenda through workplace training, through educational initiatives in the community and community development. Um, and the particular organisation I was working for um, did environmental theatre. So I even had to jump in and uh, do some uh, uh, amateur acting around all sorts of different um, environmental performances, which um, was funny because uh, you'll see later, but one of the, the biggest fears that I had when I was sort of at that age was public speaking. Um, so there, from there, um, I actually, the, the climate change agenda was starting to really be pushed and emissions trading came onto the, the policy table and I jumped into the energy utility sector to help get them started up and prepared for emissions trading. Uh, I worked at a utility called Gemini. Um, I worked there for the first three years, getting them set up for emissions trading and it was quite amazing. And then there was a policy change and uh, a government change, sorry. And um, that got taken away. Um, it was a very, very sad time. Um, and as a result of that, I stayed at the utility and started working in national energy policy reform because I'd started proving myself in the way that I could comment on legislation and um, I guess prepare for industry changes and that sort of thing. So I had a broader brief in a role around national energy policy reform and all the different big picture things, I guess, involving billions of dollars across the industry. Um, and I worked in that for 10 years, um, involved with lots of industry associations, um, mainly focused on, I guess, um, economic sort of reforms in the earlier part, but then in the last five years, technology enablement started to come back into the picture. Um, so I worked a lot on uh, grid batteries, EV enablement, hydrogen, bioenergy um, from about uh, 2015 onwards. Um, from there, uh, that's where I sort of focused on policies to sort of scale up new technologies. Um, in 2020, I left and, and established my own consulting business, which I've been doing for the, next, for the last two and a half years, working with a variety of different players across um, the research, across utilities, um, and even in other sectors. But I guess it was important for me to just give you a little bit of a story to know who I am, where I've come from, um, and what I get in, involved in. Um, and, you know, as I, when you're meeting with people from the industry, it's really important that you work up your story um, and, you know, it's got meaning for you and it will have meaning for them and you'll develop closer, quicker relationships, as, as I said. So um, I'll go on to my next side, slide. And um, again, this is a little bit of a personal share, but I hope, you know, what I like to try and do is create memorable sort of conversations. So I hope, you know, I'll, I'll take you back to it. I guess in the, um, this, photo um, means a lot to me. Um, uh, it's, it was back in 2004. I've, I, I've mentioned my fear of public speaking. Um, I've also, also had an incredible fear, like a paralyzing fear in, um, of heights throughout my life. Um, and But I, I, uh, this was the moment where I um, overcame that paralyzing fear. Um, I'd been on a truck tour in uh, Southern Africa 
uh, spending time with some amazing people who I'd never met before. Um, and we got to a place in Namibia um, where they were offering up skydiving uh, experiences. And because I had developed such a close relationship with all the people on that trip, I felt um, able to take on one of my biggest fears. Um, so my message for you around, you know, in the context of making your way in the new energy industry is build up that support network around you. Um, because with that support, and I'm looking at the crazy diving instructor uh, attached to my back, and, you know, there's really important mentors, um, you know, that have helped me in my career. Um, seek out mentors to help you in your careers. Um, because the new energy industry is inherently a risky one. Not all the technologies and all the ventures that sort of happen in the new energy in industry end up in success. So, you know, you will be navigating that. Not everything will work out, but it's important, uh, you know, to step in, uh, at, but it's important to be able to manage your fears around that. Now, what, you know, one example of me overcoming my fears, you know, I've given you in my personal life, um, you know, and that was came around sort of support networks and, and people and feeling more comfortable and brave enough to take something on and, and make the jump. Uh, but there's many other different things that can help around overcoming and managing fear. Um, and when I talk about fear, it could be, you know, uh, anxiety. Uh, it could be, you know, the fear of dreading something. Uh, it could be that absolutely paralyzing sort of fear I talked about around um, fear of heights. Um, other things that have, that have helped me through my career are counselling and, and various psychological sort of um, support, um, which is I think is really important and really healthy uh, to be at the top of your game in this industry. If I look to, you know, um, sporting clubs and, and the type of psychology advice that they're giving their athletes absolutely primed to, you know, uh, compete to the top of their ability, um, you know, competing in to the top of your ability in the new energy industry, um, you know, requires that sort of wisdom. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid of seeking out whatever support you need to realise your successes and, and tread this you know, amazingly rewarding pathway, as, as they say, no risk, no reward. Um, and I look back on this image every so often just to, you know, give myself the confidence to take on the new next big thing. So, you know, find those moments in your life and, and celebrate them and, and keep, you know, uh, you know, keep them to give the energy you need to go forward. I'll just move on to the next slide. When I when I sort of talked about my career and I mentioned a lot of, I guess, technical sort of things and, and having that technical sort of prowess as an engineer is super, super important. And it's an absolute given that you've got to devote a lot of time and, and you know, be proficient in that area. Um, but it's not the only thing. And, you know, on reflection for me, um, that technical sort of side of things was, you know, a safer space I felt more comfortable in. And I probably indulged a little bit too much in it, um, in the safety of that. Um, so I'd encourage you all, um, you know, while you're building up your technical skills, um, to be very conscious and very focused around building up all the non-technical skills that um, complement your technical skills and 
what you will find is that if you're putting more effort and energy into those non-technical skills, they will actually make you better technically. Because a lot of those non-technical skills and the World Economic Forum has done some fantastic work on um, their education 4.0 framework. Um, what they've really uh, created is a common language and framework for lifelong learning. So, so these um, uh, emphasised elements, if you look at uh, the level three on this, um, on this graphic, are really important, um, I guess, uh, non-technical um, or non-discipline specific, I should say, sort of skills um, that you should be focused on and thinking about how you're developing your skills in, in those different areas. And it's anywhere from creativity, which I remember as a young engineer, I told myself in my mind that I wasn't creative and I wasn't good with um, creative things. Um, and I had to unpick that over time. And now I do a lot of creative stuff and, and can say I'm, I'm quite good in that that area, but things like collaboration, super, super important, you know, and you've got to put yourself in positions where you expose yourself to doing that and learning from that. Uh, you know, even down to things like civic responsibility, environmental stewardship, empathy and kindness, knowing more about your emotions and connecting with others. So. Um, I encourage people to, you know, get much more familiar with this uh, fantastic framework. Um, and I've I've sort of been quite involved in in designing uh, a future fuels hackathon, which really um, a lot of my thinking that I put into that was making sure that giving spaces where a lot of these sort of skills can be really worked upon and it's been fantastic to see and I know UNSW has supported that really well the students and I hope they continue to develop those skills through that and other programs so uh, next slide thank you yeah like I mentioned about networks and, and relationships. And I've, I've just put a like a sprinkling of different sort of uh, organisations that I'm, you know, doing work and have been involved with um, just to sort of get you focused on thinking about when, when, you know, when you're either in industry or positioning yourself to go in industry, look for opportunities around where, you know, industry associations and, you know, I've put up an example there of Energy Networks Australia or research collaborations like Future Fuels CRC or C4Net, Centre for New Energy Technologies, um, or I guess professional body membership, you know, ICME, there's Engineers Australia, um, iMove is another research um, body on the transport sort of side. Um, and also um, Energy Charter, which is across uh, the industry sort of collaborative network. These are the sorts of, um, you know, areas that I'm seeking out to sort of do work with, be involved in, meet lots of people in the industry and lots of opportunities that have come out of that, whether for just growing your knowledge or, you know, doing doing work and, and that sort of thing. The other thing I'd sort of mention is it's not just these industry sort of bodies that are, that are really um, fantastic growth opportunities. It's also, you know, community organisations. I've been a president of a football club. Um, that just happened through me joining as a player, organising social events, and all of a sudden circumstances happened where I 
sort of took on that role in my mid twenties. I learned so much about engaging with people and communicating through that. I was um, on the the local uh, uh, primary schools um, board. Um, get got so many skills out of that, you know. So don't spread yourself wide around your networks, and you'll find that all sorts of related opportunities shake out of them that you wouldn't, you know, couldn't dream of. So. Um, I'll just go on to the next slide. Yeah, I'll, I'll, energy policy, and I, look, I, I'm a person who's worked in energy policy a long time, so maybe I'm a, a bit biased, but um, it's having a much bigger impact on energy markets than ever before, and, and that's because things have have to change around decarbonisation. Um, so gone are the days where in some parts of the energy sector, they sort of felt like they could, I guess, get on with different projects and not have too much mind of what the policy settings were or how they could impact their projects. Um, those days are gone. The, there's so much more regulatory intervention and policy, I guess, development that's occurring that's needed to enable this uh, decarbonisation and energy transition. Um, the sooner you get to know how that's being driven by which policy uh, agencies and departments within government and the politics that sort of played around that, um, the sooner you'll have a much more strategic perspective and around what projects are more likely to succeed, what technologies are more likely to see, succeed and getting support. So um, taking, you know, a, a first point, uh, first step, there's a great uh, report that comes out each year called the State of the Energy Market. That's a great thing to sort of have a quick scan across and know what's happening in the sector that's put out by the Australian Energy Regulator. Um, but yeah, keeping an eye on, I guess, what's happening at the state level and then what's happening in, you know, um, various states, which can drive the agenda of, of different um, decarbonisation strategies. So, um, Take an in interest in policy earlier um, and you'll reap the benefits of it around picking the right sectors, you know, right parts of the energy industry where, you know, support is flowing and momentum is being gained. Uh, next slide, thank you. All right, this is, this is my last slide. Um, and this is, oh no, second last slide actually. Um, and this is another really personal slide to me. This, um, this amazing woman is my 100 year old grandmother. Um, she's been an amazing source of support for me throughout my entire life. Um, she turned 100 on the 1st of February uh, this year and um, I, it was amazing to go back and have a huge uh, celebration with her and, and our family and, and friends. Um, a couple of months ago, um, uh, so that, that was just a fantastic time in our family. She, uh, her, her word of advice was, um, because uh, I asked her, I said, oh, man, what's, what's your secret? What's the, you know, the, the thing, you know, you, you know, out of 100 years of living? And she's amazing in that she still lives at home by herself and was still driving um, up to that, that point. Um, and she said, Benji, um, just take it one day at a time. <laughs> just, I love the simplicity in you know, wise people who've lived a long time 
Um, we can create a lot of confusion, a lot of complexity around what we're doing. But her, yeah, her advice to me was, yep, you've got all these plans and, you know, make your plans and all of that. But then, you know, um, pretty quickly focus every day on just what needs to be done and, and just do it that way. It'll make it simpler. So awesome source of advice. But I also sort of got the opportunity to see her sort of and just like really marvel at her resilience just over the last couple of months because after turning 100 um, she had to go into hospital for the first time ever um, and have a, a medical procedure. Um, I went back to Tassie in a bit of a flat uh, thinking oh my god you know how is she going to survive you know she, she must be so frightened and you know like I'm, I'm not the best in hospitals and that sort of thing um i got back to tassie walked into the hospital room and looked at her and she was laying back in bed comfortable and and like the queen she is and um she said and i said how are you now and she said benji i'm i'm having a holiday <laughs> and i just you know it's just amazing, I think, you know, the people you meet um, in your life and, and I guess, you know, I'm lucky to have, you know, my nan, you know, in my life, but really take on those, um, you know, take notice of those people, I think, who share their wisdom in the way that they move through life. Um, and my nan, is definitely one of them. And she, uh, I told her that I'd be mentioning her in this um, presentation and uh, on the phone uh, last week. And she was super chuffed to know that she was, you know, that was happening. Um, yeah, but the, the message for me around, you know, around this is, is just be aware of the marathon you're running amidst all the sprints. Now in new energy, we are sprinting all the time. There's lots of new projects, there's lots of different things that we're doing that have got big deadlines and can get super stressful, anxiety can come up, um, all sorts of <laughs> uncomfortable feelings. But take a breath, take a step back and just realise too that it's a bigger marathon and we might be making, you know, a, some particular mountains out of molehills that, um, you know, with our emotions riding high, uh, you know, leading to cat catastrophization and, and whatever else. Um, so step back and just think about the marathon and think about that it'll, that'll be all okay in the bigger, the bigger picture. Um, now, Next slide is my last slide, um, and I'm conscious because I'm keen to have, you know, any questions that people want to throw at me. So I, I just wanted to just say a little bit about the power of questions. Um, I did an Australian Institute of Company Directors course uh, a couple of years ago. That helps, you know, prepare you um, for board positions and, and that sort of thing on company boards. Um, I'd already done, you know, some sort of not-for-profit uh, governance positions and that sort of thing, but it was a brilliant course and I really recommend it to any of you, you know, at points in your career when it's appropriate to do it. Um, and the biggest learning that came out for me was to get good at asking questions. Um, and, you know, questions can be framed in a way that are not thoughtful and lead to not much discussion. And you can ask very closed questions, which will just get you a yes or a no. And, you know, you don't get much insight out of, out of that. Or you can ask very insightful open questions, which really, you derive so much more insight from. Um, and 
learning to do that early in your career, you'll not only supercharge your learning, but you'll position yourself, you know, to be the board members of the future um, and, you know, deliver the types of governance that we need, you know, to um, achieve all the things we do to get to net zero and lots of, uh, I guess, the societal outcomes that we need as well. So I'll leave you with that point and hopefully it will be a little spur to, um, you know, uh, get a few more questions out of the um, out of the audience, but I really appreciate your time and would so love, uh, yeah, to have some questions. And Charlotte, I'm happy, you know, to be in your hands as moderator and, and you know, yeah, answer any of yours too. Yeah, thanks Benji uh, for sharing with our audience today. And, and I already know that there are burning questions from our audience now, um, and it seems like they really appreciate your advice looking at the chat as well. Um, so I'll share a question that's raised by Sarah Grundy, who is a lecturer in our school. Um, she appreciates you sharing your journey and you've mentioned that your background was from a computing area by discipline, but have been able to switch successfully to diverse range of industry and now to energy. So what sort of advice or skills would you actually give to our students that are graduating now that has helped you successfully adapt it to any industry that you went into? It's a, it's a great question and it's... Um... Yeah, I, I'll answer it on, on two levels and, and you know, I'll, I'll try not to get too deep, but yeah. um, look, absolutely is it um, your communication skills? Um, because like I, I told, like, a, you know, in my presentation, I was talking about, um, you know, the rabbit holes of discovery that I went through you know in the technical world and in the programming world um, and you can go down those forever uh, but if you're not at the same time really putting as much effort into the communication into the collaboration into understanding your emotions understanding how to connect with people you know on a human level um, then you're going to get held back in your career and you're not going to be as transferable a as you can be. So, um, and I look to be honest, people have sort of, you know, in the, you know, olden days of sort of, I guess, being able to sort of um, just be seen as technical people and there have been roles, I guess, for people just as technical sort of gurus, but that that's changing, you know, you need to be more and more of all-rounders um, because the problems that we've got to solve have got to be solved much more quickly. So you've got to be able to do your analysis, but you've also got to be able to communicate it and you've got to move things along a much, much quicker. So you've, you've got to try and be the full package. Thanks, Benji. So next we have another one that I believe is also a part of UNSW in academia um, from Hua Chai. Um, we also appreciate your presentation. Uh, so from your perspective, how do you actually perceive the relationship between curricula related to energy systems and the evolving changes in energy policy? And by any chance, could you please suggest on what efforts might be undertaken by academics to ensure that the courses that are taught are aligned with the most current industry policies and demands? Now, can I just, uh, before I answer that question, uh, my battery saver notifications uh, come up. So just give me two ticks and I'll yeah. come back and sort that out. Yeah, 100%. So sorry to do that, no, but um, no, it's fine. It's only normal. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, look, I 
I think that there's a lot more information sharing that needs to happen to sort of bring more policy um, related information into the classroom. Uh, because if we're not, students are not tuned into that, they're not gonna hit the ground running in industry. Um, that said too, there needs to be more market related insights Thanks so much, I much appreciate it. Um, yeah, uh, needs to be much more market insights from industry brought into the classroom as well. Um, I guess I'm, I'm playing a role in that, again, through the Future Fuels Hackathon and sort of making sure that that's, those things are part of the brief. So the students participating in those uh, competitions you know, there's a driver for them to sort of seek out that information too. So um, I think there's various creative ways that it can be done. And, you know, we'll always be keen in exploring more in that area, but um, it needs to happen there. The other place that I've seen it, say in, in startups and, um, and even in new energy divisions in big utilities, they tend to underestimate the impacts that policy can have on their particular ideas and go to market sort of um, work and then end up, it becomes a barrier and they can't get their idea away because they've underestimated it. So um, yeah, the, you know, I think the industry, yeah, definitely needs to tune in more as well as on the on the student side. Thanks for the great advice. And just a follow up question to that: What would be a great place for us, as for example, students or even academics or those in the industry, to get the most updated information relating to industry policies? It's a it's a very good question. I like for me, you know start, like I'd start with, um, you know, a few key places and then build from there. Like the scariest thing with policy is that it's such a big beast, you yeah. know, it, it's on national level, it's state level, it all feeds into it itself, you know, so it can appear to be a very confusing, um, you know, and, you know, often, decisions made politically too. So um, so I again I mentioned that state of the energy market report. That's something that sort of comes out each year, which sort of looks back and you know shows where the market's at, talks about some different policy changes. So that that's a nice way to absorb it at a bigger level. But then, you know, I think once you're starting to sort of get into it, then you can sort of like take an interest in, I guess, the uh, energy ministers meetings that, you know, happen every couple of months and the communiques from there are, are you know, give a lot of insight into what, you know, it, the federal and, and state energy minister sort of counterparts, what decisions they're making, what, you know, um, uh, you know, what's their sort of key focus. Um, there's a lot, you know, of energy policy in the news now. So, you know, I'd be checking your news feed and whenever energy comes up, have a read about it and you'll be sure to learn something about uh, energy policy. Um, and then I guess it's just as you're starting to develop up relationships with industry people, um they you know have some exposure to policy and you'll learn some things from there and seek out energy policy people like me to have a chat with and you know like i guess i've had the benefit of working in you know it really heavily for 15 years um yeah so you know there's there's other people like me about um that you know, uh, uh, worth seeking out and talking to as, as well. And, you know, I guess like I'm wanting to engage with, you know, different, you know, I was happy to do this session. Um, 
yeah, and, and, you know, there's things like hackathons and different things that I sort of get involved in to help that way as well. Thanks for that. I think that's great advice. It sounds like there are many, many ways that are very accessible to all of us. We just need to know where to look. Um, so we might have one final question from Gabby Birch from the audience. Um, and this one hits really close to home um, and for all of us as well. How did you actually build up your confidence with public speaking? Did you start with smaller presentation opportunities and then build your way up to get involved in forces um, like Toastmasters? Yeah, I, like there's so many different, again, so many different ways to tackle those, the the whole beast of it all, which, which yeah. it certainly felt like for me. Like I, I remember my first um, presentation that I had to give back in uni way back when, and I was so scared about it that I completely avoided preparing for it. And it was the most excruciating, cringeworthy, you know, thing that was done ever uh, in my 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 opinion at the time um so the things that have sort of helped help me are like jumping out of the plane you know putting myself in situations where I do it and and being kind to myself in that you know it's not going to be the best effort as you're learning um but having a go um, getting involved in those, uh, you know, I guess things like Toastmasters and that I didn't do myself, but I saw other people who got benefits out of those sort of things. Looking up to mentors who were really good at it, and I was lucky, you know, uh, when I was involved in football clubs and that sort of thing, there were some really great speakers and I, you know, I learnt in the way that they did them. I had my time in working in environmental education where it was, I was working with gurus in that space and, and learned lots. Um, but like the, the deeper stuff underneath it is definitely deal, learning how to deal with your emotions and sort of um, understanding what different emotions are at play that might be holding you back, like anxiety, like dread, like you know, those sort of fears and, and you know, again, I, I spoke to sort of things like, you know, um, counselling and that sort of thing, understanding why those feelings were coming up um, and they were about other things, you know, that happened earlier in my life, um, you know, and once I understood that, it, it sort of made it a lot easier for me to, you know, I had less weight on my shoulders every time I tried to you know, do my speaking and that sort of thing. So that, yeah, the psychology and the working through your emotions is a really important part, which is funny because that's the, you know, as a technical person, um, that's not often in the general conversation or it wasn't for me, you know, going through my time. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak about that sort of part to it because it, it was really important. I, I did things like even just, um, before I was about to speak at an event, I'd take myself away from people uh, because having lots of people talking at you when you're about to go up and give a presentation on stage um, can bring up lots of emotions and make it very hard, you know, at the start. So I'd take myself away, have some calming space. I'd even jump around and shake myself around to get a, rid of a bit of that sort of anxiety that was coming up for me. So even, even just things like like that, I think, are, are helpful. But it, it's, I guess, grappling with it, you know, rather than avoiding. Like I mentioned how I avoided that one in my engineering management class, <laughs> and that was that was catastrophic. So avoiding is not never the solution. It's, it's learning ways to jump in and, and grapple with it. And persevering you know persevering on your communication but this perseverance through the new energy industry and showing you've got to show lots of that so just apply that to the different problems in front of you like engineers and technical people are great problem solvers um so just think of it as a problem you've got to solve and 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 keep keep grappling and but reach out to different people who've you know, do it well and 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 
get advice. You know, you're not alone. Um, we all, you know, we want to help, you know, to sort of, yeah, um, overcome these big challenges that we're all working on. Thanks, Benji. Thanks. I think that's a really wonderful piece of advice, treating it as a problem to solve, especially when most of our audience have engineering backgrounds. Um, so it looks like we're approaching the end of the hour. So we might just close the Q&A sessions for now. So thank you all for the fantastic questions. Uh, we are just running out of time for the time being. And we are grateful for your engagement and participation in this webinar as well. So if you have any further questions, please feel free. And I'm sure Benji is also happy to answer them on LinkedIn as well. Ab absolutely. I, I yeah. will say yeah, that LinkedIn is an excellent place to yeah. grow your network. And, um, you know, networks are like, like my last piece of advice is, um, I guess, net networks are like superannuation funds. Like, yeah you build them and they're the gift that keeps on giving you know think of it like interest coming back to you all the way through your life so start earlier on your networks and linkedin is a really important place like i'm i was an early adopter to linkedin in the energy industry and i'm just about to get to i think thirty thousand um connections and followers so um start early start engaging, start sharing your thoughts. Don't be scared. Um, I'll be out there ready to like any of your uh, posts and all of that. So um, yeah, feel free to connect with me. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, you know, if I, if I can help um, share any words of advice, I will. Yep. Thanks so much, Benji. I'm fairly certain that you'll be gaining a lot more connections after today's webinar as well from our audience. Uh, Thanks for look, that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just want to thank you, Charlotte. I really appreciate, um, you know, your facilitation of, of today. Um, uh, Lena, um, thank you so much, um, and and Michael as well, and Francis, and everyone involved behind the scenes who, you know, work and collaborate together to put these events on. Um, you know, it, it's it's a lot of work, but um, I really appreciate it, and I hope hope your audience does too. And and just hope everyone have, has a great day. Yeah, thanks, Benji. So we would just like to thank you again as a whole for sharing your valuable insights and expertise because your passion and dedication towards mentoring as well has been really inspiring. And we certainly hope that all our participants have found this webinar to be beneficial and it has given you a clearer view towards the successful career in this new energy sector. Um, yeah, thank you everyone again uh, for joining us today. And like Benji said, have a wonderful day. Thank you.